Welcome once again to Things Concerning Himself. I'm Pastor John Anderson. Thank you for joining us today on Loma Linda Broadcasting Network as we continue to explore the Old Testament scriptures to find pictures of Jesus. The, the focus of our study today has to do with something that Jesus brought to light himself. And right after our prayer, we'll get into our study. Please bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for our wonderful Redeemer who came to this earth to die for our sins, to give us an example of how to live and give us hope for the future in this dark world. And thank you especially for the passages of Scripture that we are going to look at today that foretell many things about his life and ministry. And through all this, Lord, we pray that not only will we gain confidence that the Bible is true and that Jesus actually came, but what his life and death means for us individually today. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we're going to take a look at something that Jesus uh, addressed specifically as far as being a source of information about himself in the Old Testament. And I take you back to that Sunday, the day that he rose from the grave. And we find that uh, uh, he appeared to Mary first, and then he appeared to two disciples as they were on their way to a little village called Emmaus. And I want to pause here just for a second because I love the way the Bible presents Jesus and his humility, his stepping down, uh, not being boastful. This was Resurrection Sunday. This was the day that he won the victory, uh, having died on the cross and now come forth from the grave. He is the king of the universe. He has accomplished his mission. And yet notice how he appears. He appears to Mary and she doesn't recognize him. Now it may be that her ear, your eyes were dimmed with tears and so on, but she thinks that he's the gardener. She thinks that he's the caretaker and he's the king of glory. What a beautiful thought. And then he appears to the two disciples on their way to this village called Emmaus. And again, they don't recognize him for, for who he is. He appears just as being a, a traveler. They're surprised that he's not... Uh, up on all the events of the weekend, weekend and so on. And so they, they travel. When they reach their destination, then uh, as they come close, uh, the Bible says that Jesus opened their eyes to the scriptures and spoke to them from the Old Testament, the things concerning himself, which of course is the title of our series. So in all the scriptures, the Bible says there in Luke 24, he, he uh, brought to their attention the things that concerned himself. But later that very day, he met with the disciples, and he was a little bit more specific in how he spoke about the Old Testament scriptures in that, in that setting. We're looking at Luke 24, verse 44. Luke 24, 44. He said to them, the disciples, These are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So those were the three divisions that the people of their day uh, saw how the Old Testament was, was uh, composed. The Law of Moses, that would be, in general, the books of history. And that would take you from the way our Bible is organized. It would take you from uh, Genesis through the book of Esther. That's the section of history. And then we have the section of literature or the Psalms. And, of course, that would begin with Job and go through the Song of Solomon, include the book of Psalms. And then you have the... the uh, the prophets writings and that would of course take you from Isaiah all the way through Malachi so those are the three divisions of the scriptures so when Jesus talked about the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms he was basically saying uh, the Old Testament but he did specifically mention the Psalms and that's what we want to take a look at today where is Jesus in the Psalms and I want to tell you this is a exciting and fruitful study we're going to go through quite a number of texts. I'm going to invite you, if you have an interest, to have a, a paper and pencil handy because uh, you may want to write these things down. It's so fruitful. The study is so abundant in material in the book of Psalms that tell us about Jesus and his, his life and his death. Uh, so have a pencil and paper handy if you want to write the text down. The word Psalms that we have in our English language uh, comes from the Greek word psalmos, and it means song. So when you think of the, the book of Psalms, you're actually looking at the hymn book of the people of ancient times. These were the songs that they sang in their congregational gatherings or that they would sing uh, by themselves. But this was their, their hymn book. It's interesting to me 
that the words are preserved. We know very little about the tunes. Obviously, when they sang, there was melody, there was a tune to it, but we have very little knowledge of what those tunes might have been. But the words, the content, the substance, the lyrics, that was what has been preserved in the Holy Scriptures. And Jesus said, they tell my story. The book of Psalms tells my story. When we refer to the entire uh, section, we call them the book of Psalms. When we're referring to in an individual one, we talk about Psalm 22, which we'll be looking at a lot today, or Psalm 69. Singular when we use it that way. Plural, we talk about the book of Psalms. I've heard many people say, let's take a look at Psalms 22. But that would be like saying, let's sing Psalms 22. And we, we would not use the plural in that setting. So the book of Psalms, a, a, uh, a fruitful, a rich mine of material about Jesus the Christ. When we think about how his... His uh, story is told. We're going to see it as being divided into four main sections. We're going to take a look at prophecies that have to do with his, his uh, birth and his family line, his heritage. We'll take a look at uh, prophecies that have to do with his, his uh, role and his function, his ministry. We'll take a look at prophecies that have to do with uh, his betrayal and death. And that actually is a, a very large section of prophecies that deal with Jesus' betrayal and death in the book of Psalms. And then we'll take a look at some prophecies that deal with his resurrection, his ascension, and his glorification or his exaltation being placed at God's right hand. Now, most of the Psalms, but not all of them, were written by David. You'll come to a place where uh, it says the, the uh, writings of David are, are finished. Now, there are some after that statement that are Psalms of David, but prior to them, they are Psalms of David. And then after them, uh, we have some other Psalms that were composed by individuals, Asaph, his sons, and even uh, the prophet Moses uh, is credited with the uh, writing of Psalm 90 and possibly Psalm 91 too. So uh, most of these are from the pen of David and David's life experience. What a story. You know, he came from uh, humble beginnings. He was a shepherd being one of the youngest in the in the family of Jesse there. Very humble beginnings, but then he was exalted to be the king of Israel. But along the way, there were a lot of detours. There were a lot of bumps in the road, and he had to flee from King Saul, his monarch, who threatened his life at least a dozen times. And then his own son Absalom wanted to steal the throne and, and take his life. So David's life experience had a lot of, a, a, a lot of things that were turbulent, a lot of the things that were sorrowful and negative, and yet he found, he found comfort and, uh, and hope in looking to God. Now, it's a great question that uh, we can't answer specifically, but because so many of these psalms are what we call messianic, if you're not familiar with that term, it means referring to the Messiah, referring to Jesus the Christ. When David wrote these out, was he writing about his own life experience that also happened to be what Jesus would experience. And we believe that there are definitely uh, some of the Psalms that fit into that category. Or under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was he writing things out that pertained uniquely to Jesus the Christ and really didn't emanate from his own personal life experience? It's an interesting question to think about when you're going through these passages. And by the way, uh, we're going to go through a number of Bible texts. I, again, invite you to write them down go back to them. But more than that, I would invite you just to read through the book of Psalms from the first to the last, 150 chapters. And as you read, allow the Holy Spirit to impress your mind as to which of these passages are telling the story of Jesus. There are no doubt many that uh, are in that category that we won't have time to, to look at today. But for your own blessing, for your own spiritual uh, benefit, uh, take a look, read the Psalms from that point of view, telling the story of the Christ through the writings of David and the other authors of the Psalms. So let's take a look at uh, some of these different categories. Uh, there are a number of uh, websites that will help you out on this. I looked at uh, quite a number of them. One that I found to be quite helpful was one that was called shalak, S-H-A-L-A-C-H dot org, shalak dot org. And uh, uh, many scholars and students have done what we're doing right now, going through the Psalms and seeing how Jesus is portrayed in them. So what do we find in the book of Psalms that tells us the story of Jesus? Thinking, first of all, about his, his birth and his 
his family line. In some cases, we'll take time to read the scriptures, uh, but because there's so many that I want to share with you, uh, we're not going to take the time to read all of them. But in Psalm 89, verses 3 and 4, Psalm 89, verse 3 and 4, we are told that the Messiah, when he would come, would come through the lineage of King David. And uh, in the New Testament, we find that that is verified in Matthew 1, verse 1, that it traces the family line of, of uh, Christ all the way back through David and beyond. In the Psalms, we find that the Messiah would be the Son of God, Psalm 2, verse 7. And of course, that's verified in the story of when Gabriel visited Mary and told her that she would undergo a miraculous, unprecedented birth, and that through the power of the Holy Spirit that would come upon her and overshadow her, the Christ would be born, the one who would be the Son of God. And in Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7, we're going to take time to read this one. Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7, uh, which, by the way, is a very beautiful psalm. It portrays the marriage of the king. And you can read this psalm from the perspective of Christ, the heavenly groom, marrying his bride, the Christian church. But what are, what are we told here in Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7 about Christ, the heavenly groom? It says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. ever. A scepter of righteousness is in the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Christ was anointed to be able to uh, fulfill his role of being the Savior. The word anointed in the Old Testament is the word that we get Messiah from. And the New Testament word to mean that refers to someone who is anointed is Christos, which we get Christ from that term. So the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who was prepared to accomplish this mission of salvation, and refers to him and says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now, when the book of Hebrews was written, which was specifically written to try to win the people of the Jewish race to accept Jesus as the Messiah, this verse is quoted in Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 8 and 9 and uh, ref applied specifically to Jesus Christ. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So in the book of Psalms, Jesus is portrayed as the Messiah. He is portrayed as being divine. He is God. And the Messiah, the one who would atone for sins, had to be divine because a divine law was broken and only a divine sacrifice could atone. And that's why it says the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, is above his com companions. In this setting with uh, perhaps angelic hosts surrounding in this beautiful wedding picture, Jesus is above. And that's the point of Hebrews chapter 1, that Jesus is better, more exalted than the angels who themselves excel in strength. Jesus is God. The book of Psalms bears that out. Now, let's pass on quickly to uh, those Psalms that talk about Jesus' role and his function and his, in his uh, ministry. We're told in Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27, again quoted in Hebrews chapter 1 that the Messiah is the creator. This is a very, very important uh, concept. If you turn to the 102nd Psalm, which I'm doing right now, Psalm 102, it's a psalm that uh, praises the Lord for his created works and so on. And as it begins, this, this part of the narrative, it refers to the one who is responsible, the creator. And it says in verse 12 of Psalm 102, you, O Lord, will endure forever and the remembrance of your name to all generations. What I want to point out to you in that verse, if you don't know it already, if you have your Bible open, you can see this, that the term Lord in Psalm 102, verse 12, is in all capital letters. That means that in the Hebrew text, it's Yahweh or Jehovah. And in Hebrews chapter 1, and that is, would be verses um, 10 through 12, the passage from Psalm 102 is quoted and again applied directly to Jesus. Jesus is the Yahweh of the Old Testament. He is the divine, the creator, the one who brought it all into existence, which Psalm 102 is uh, praising the Lord for. In Psalm 110, Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one, is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. We, in another session, discussed that more particularly, but Christ was not from the family of Aaron. He was from the tribe of Judah, where kings came from, like King David. 
Uh, but nevertheless, he is qualified to be a priest because he's from a different order, not the order of Aaron, but the order of Melchizedek, going back to Genesis chapter 14. And uh, Hebrews, again, chapters 5 through 7, uh, apply that directly to Jesus Christ. Prophecies having to do with the Messiah's ministry. One of the important things that uh, he would do, he would reveal that the scriptures speak of him. Let's turn to this psalm. It's in chapter 40 of the Psalms. Psalm 40 and verses 6 to 8, again quoted in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews. Psalm 40, beginning with verse 6, we read, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come. Who was the coming one? That was even a title that was given to the Messiah, the coming one. Well, that's, of course, Jesus Christ. Then I said, behold, I come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. What a beautiful thought that is. In the scroll of the book, that is the scriptures of the Old Testament, it is written of me. So in that Psalm 40, like we've seen in Luke 24, John 5, 39, Jesus said, these, the scriptures, testify of me. We find that that uh, was actually a prophecy given in the 40th Psalm. Your law is written within my heart. And that's quoted in the book of Hebrews. Um, we find that uh, in chapter 10 of Hebrews, verses 5 through 7. So Christ's role, his, his mission was uh, outlined in the Old Testament scriptures before he even came. We find that, we find that he would have to endure many uh, accusations and afflictions and wrong, wrongdoing by the leaders of his time. That's prophesied in the book of, of Psalms. We find that one thing that Jesus would do would be to try to correct the wrongful practices that were, were being conducted by the religious leaders. We're going to take a quick look here at uh, Psalm 69 and verse 9. Psalm 69 and verse 9. It says, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Now, when Jesus began his ministry, we're told in the uh, first couple of chapters of John there, when he went into the temple, his eyes were disappointed to see what was going on there. People were selling animals at exorbitant prices, and the priests were uh, uh, stealing money from the people, really, because you had to buy the temple coin in order to purchase an animal, and the exchange rate was uh, very disfavorable to the people. And it was presenting a picture of God, the most generous being in the universe, in a very wrong light. What, was, what the temple was supposed to tell people was the truth about God's character. But that, that picture, of, as Jesus walked into the temple as he began his ministry, was a, was a picture that was 180 degrees opposite of what it was supposed to be. And so the Bible says that Jesus drove out the money changers and he overturned the tables and so on. When that happened, we read this in John chapter 2, 13 through 17. The disciples remembered the text that we just read in Psalm 69. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So some of the things that Jesus would do, uh, healing, teaching, preaching, instructing, and this matter of cleansing the temple uh, was prophesied in the book of Psalms. It tells us in the book of Psalms uh, 78 and verse 2 that he would speak in parables. Very interesting uh, because parable uh, teaching as a method uh, was used extensively by Christ. Uh, someone has written out a list and found that there are about 40 parables in the New Testament. And of course, that's not an exhaustive list. There were many, I'm, I'm sure, that he spoke that were not recorded. But uh, teaching through parables was something that Jesus uh, made extensive use of, and that was prophesied back in the book of Psalms, Psalm 78, verse 2. Let's go on quickly to those prophecies that have to do with his betrayal and his death. We find in Psalm 2, Verses 1 and 3, that religious leaders would plot against him. And obviously, the New Testament records, sadly, how that was uh, uh, actually, a accurately uh, fulfilled. He would be rejected by his own people. We're going to turn to Psalm 22 in this case, because Psalm 22 is one of the uh, richest of all the psalms having to do with uh, Christ, particularly uh, at the end of his life, his betrayal, his crucifixion, his death, and so on. There are many things in that psalm that are referred to in the New Testament. 
but he would be rejected by his own people, we're told in verses 6 and 7. And in John chapter 1, verse 11, we're told that he came to his own, and his own received him not. And a, a more accurate translation would be he came to his own things, but his own people did not receive him. That chapter, by the way, Psalm 22, begins with uh, something that Jesus himself spoke when he was on the cross. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These words were wrenched from his heart of anguish as he died on the cross bearing our sins. The weight of the guilt of our transgressions being upon him forced those words. And the Jewish leaders had turned their back from him. The disciples had fled. And it seemed to him at that moment, it seemed to him that even his father had abandoned him. And so he cried out uh, with these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That anguish Jesus felt because he was in the stead, he was in the, in the place of the lost sinner who one day would feel that rejection, that abandonment, that uh, desperation. And those words came from Christ's life. He would be condemned for Christ's sake, for, for God's sake, it tells, tells us in Psalm 69. He would be hated without cause, Psalm 69. The Messiah would be accused by false witnesses, Psalm 27, verse 12, Psalm 35, verse 11, Psalm 109, verse 2. And of course, the books of the Gospels, Matthew and onward, tell us sadly how that was fulfilled. He would be silent before his accusers, Psalm 38, 13, and 14. The Messiah would be crucified. Now, Psalm 22 Verse 14 talks about his hands and his feet being pierced. Crucifixion as a form of execution was not invented until about the 6th century B.C., as far as historical records go that we have access to. And yet in Psalm 22, when it talks about his hands and his feet being pierced, it's a very clear depiction of what happened to Jesus literally when he was on the cross. That was Psalm 22, verse 14. And 16, the, the uh, Messiah would be abandoned by his, his disciples, Psalm 22, verse 11. He would be surrounded by wicked men, Psalm 22, verse 12, and verse 13. And you remember the story of how when Jesus was crucified, he wasn't crucified by himself. There were two, the, the Bible calls them malefactors, evildoers, one at each side. Christ was in the middle. And sad to say, that was for the intent of making it seem like he was the chief among the criminals. But of course, from God's point of view, it was pointing out that he is the center of salvation and redemption. But he was crucified between two who, when they went to the cross initially, joined in the mockery and sarcasm that was being offered by those that surrounded Calvary. Now, praise God that one of them, in that experience, had a change of heart and was converted. He's the only person in the Bible that we know from the word from the, the words that came out of Christ's lips himself that he will be in heaven. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, Today I'm telling you, you are going to be with me in paradise. But what Psalm 22 said was absolutely fulfilled, that he was surrounded by, by uh, those who had committed acts of wickedness. He would be mocked, Psalm 22, verse 7. Think of the tragedy of that, that insults and cruel jesting uh, statements came from the lips of those who should, who should have been teaching the grace and the love of God. What a sad thing that the ones who occupied the positions foremost to teaching the scriptures that reveal the God of love and the coming one, the Messiah who would die on the cross, were among the leaders who Satan used to taunt and torment and uh, mock the Savior. The Bible predicted that. The amazing thing is that Jesus knew all this before he came, and he still was willing to come and uh, be our Lord and Savior. What an amazing Savior we have. Unbelievers would say, notice this also, a quote from Psalm 22, verse 8. He trusted in God, let him now deliver him. Now this is written a thousand years before Jesus came and hung on the cross. And yet you find in the New Testament that those words were quoted nearly verbatim, Matthew 27, 41 to 43. Very, very interesting. His garments would be parted among the soldiers by casting lots, we're told in Psalm 22, verse 18. And that is precisely what happened because Christ's garment was a seamless garment. They said, let's not cut it apart. Let's throw dice for it. Let's cast lots for it. And the Bible tells us that that is exactly what happened. 
he would cry out, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Psalm 31, verse 5. And this was literally fulfilled. Those were among the last words that Jesus spoke. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. What we need to realize is that those words were said that Friday on Calvary. They were said every day of Jesus' life. Into your hands I commit my spirit. All my decisions, all my plans are in your lap, Lord. You lead me, you direct me. So that when he came to the cross experience, when he came to Calvary, that prayer was something that he had offered every day of his life. It wasn't just spoken that day when he was put on the cross. His heart would be broken, Psalm 69, verse 20. Jesus died of a broken heart. Remember that the soldiers were surprised when they came there to find that he'd already died. Usually it took days for a crucified victim to expire. But Jesus had already died because he died of a broken heart. And that was prophesied in Psalm 69, verse 20. Um, None of his bones would be broken, we're told in Psalm 34, verse 20. And that was literally fulfilled as well. Now, also the Psalms clearly predict that Jesus would be raised from the dead, that his body would not see corruption. Psalm 16, 8 through 10. And this is uh, quoted in the book of Acts as being verification that Jesus is the Christ. His own resurrection was, was predicted And whereas Lazarus was in the grave four days to the point where his body had begun the process of decomposition and corruption, Christ was not in the grave that long. His body did not see corruption. He came forth in triumph from the grave. And he would ascend to heaven, be exalted, and uh, be at the right hand of God to be our Lord and Savior. So Jesus told the disciples that Sunday, it is written of me, the law of Moses, and in the Psalms, and in the prophets. And today we've taken a brief look at many of the passages, not all of them. I invite you again to read through the entire book of Psalms and notice how many times there are verses that can be applied directly to Christ and his ministry and his death. He was predicted to be the Lamb of God, the Messiah, and I hope that he is your Savior and your Lord. Thank you for joining us today in things concerning himself on Loma Linda Broadcasting Network. And I hope that you plan to join us the next time as we continue our search in the Old Testament to find pictures of Jesus. Let's bow our heads as we close today. Father in heaven, thank you that you sent Jesus to this earth to be our Savior. We're thankful that in looking at these many detailed prophecies given in the book of Psalms and how accurately that they were fulfilled in Jesus' life and his ministry and his death, that we can have confidence that he is the one. Lord, today we want to say, I commend into your hands my spirit.